All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So welcome to 6004, lecture 10, Procedures and Stacks. Um, so in the last lecture, we shifted gears from combinational and sequential logic and started discussing and learning about programmable architectures, and in particular, the RISC-V instruction set architecture. And so as Silvina described last lecture, remember that an ISA is basically two things. Uh, it specifies both the set of storage locations that you have in your machine. So in the case of RISC-V, you had registers and you had memory. Um, and it also specifies the set of instructions um, that essentially let you manipulate and process data in these different locations. Um, and so, you know, we saw that there were computational instructions, loads and stores to access memory and move data from and to registers and memory, um, and then control instructions to affect the uh, path of execution throughout uh, the code. Uh, so what we're going to do today is, is dive deeper and essentially uh, derive a systematic procedure to translate uh, high-level programs, or programs written in a high-level language, um, into assembly, right? Um, and so this, this procedure, or this method, is, is called compilation, and is what a compiler uh, does uh, all the time automatically. Uh, we're going to do this in, in three different parts. So first, we'll uh, take a look at how to compile simple code fragments, um, things like individual expressions, um, conditional statements like if and if-else, um, and then loops, like while, for, and so on. Um, and then we will uh, spend the, the second part of the lecture essentially uh, looking at how to compile procedures or, su or subroutines, function calls. Um, essentially, procedures are a key building block or the key building block of uh, modern programs. They're essentially reusable code fragments, um, and we'll see how we can uh, essentially establish a convention that lets us um, compile each procedure individually and have all these different procedures understand each other and call each other. Uh, and finally, we'll see how you know, this all comes together by looking at how the memory looks, um, uh, the memory of the machine looks uh, during the execution of a program. OK, so let's start with uh, you know, compiling simple code fragments, and in particular with simple expressions. And so Sylvina already uh, mentioned uh, how, to, how to do this in, in, uh, you know, to a good degree last time. Uh, but basically, let's, let's uh, go through it again uh, as a reminder. So if I give you some high-level code right, that just has some statements, like this one over here, this is, uh, this is uh, some, some C code where x, y, and c are 32-bit integer values, and there are some expressions um, that assign you know, some computations uh, to y and c. Um, so basically, what you have to do to produce, uh, to translate this to assembly is essentially we need to assign the different variables to different registers, um, and then we'll go translating the different operations one by one, right? So, you know, we don't have an instruction that can do all these operations all at once, um, but we do have instructions that let, let us do, you know, most binary operations. So one by one, we'll go translating those into individual uh, RISC-V instructions. Um, by the way, I mentioned compiling into high-level languages. Um, you know, it'd be great if we could compile Python into assembly. Unfortunately, Python has several features uh, that are not, that make it hard to compile. So for example, you know, variables are not typed, don't have an explicit type. Um, and that introduces a lot of complexity on the, on the compiler side. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, there, are, there are some techniques that will let you compile uh, parts of Python, but these are far beyond the scope of uh, of this class. Um, and so the language, the high-level language that we're going to use is C. C is essentially the most widely used systems language. Uh, and we're going to use a very small subset of C. So um, we'll, we'll post a handout on the website uh, that will very quickly give you an overview of the subset of C that we will be using. OK, so uh, starting from this, from this C code, um, you know, the first step is, again, we need to assign uh, some variables, uh, you know, a register for each variable. And when we have complex expressions, we also need some registers to hold temporaries. Uh, because sometimes we're going to need to store the result of part of these operations uh, in, in some uh, location that's not either of these variables. Um, and so then we can go uh, essentially expression by ex expression, statement by statement, 
um, compiling each individual operation, right? So for example, how would you compile x plus three? So we say that x10, register x10 holds variable x. Can anybody tell me what instruction you would use to uh, compute x plus three? Arai, yes. So we can take arai, you can write arai into x13, which is one, one temporary register, one of our temporary registers, uh, and a source operands, we use x10, right? And then the immediate three, right? So because three is a small constant, we can write it directly in the instruction. So let's uh, go to this other side. So uh, how do you compute y plus one, two, three, four, five, six? Can I write add i, um, let's say, x14, x11, one, two, three, four, five, six? Is there any problem with that? <coughs> that number is bigger than the allowed right. instruction. Exactly. So um, remember that these constants, uh, these instructions with an immediate operand, uh, only have 12 bits to support, uh, you know, to encode the immediate. And so if you have something that's smaller than minus 2048 or larger than 2047, we need some other way to load the value into our register, the value into our register first. Um, and so one convenient way that RISC -V, um, RISC v assembly has to do this is through the load immediate pseudo, pseudo instruction. Um, and so we basically can write load immediate x14, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that will put this 32-bit constant into x14. And then we can use a normal add instruction. Remember that uh, the difference between add i and add is that add i operates on a register and an immediate encoding encoded direct, directly in the instruction. Add operates on two register sources and produces the result in a different register. OK. Um, now, we have these two parts of the expression. How do we put it all together? Can anybody tell me how to execute this? You know, what instruction do we need to run this final OR operation and produce the value into the register that holds Y? Yes? Sorry? It is doing bitwise OR. So this is exactly like blue spec. So, so it's bit by bit doing the OR of both um, operands of both sides. And so in this guy, in this case, Risk Five has an OR instruction that we can use, right? Essentially, ORing the contents of X13 and X14 and producing the result in register X11, right? Okay, how about X times four? Unfortunately. For us as programmers, but fortunately for us, when we get to implement the Risk Five processor, we don't have a multiply instruction. Um, and so, yes, uh, yes, exactly, very good. So you can shift left by two positions, and that uh, will multiply the number by four. And then we XOR with uh, the contents of register Y, and so we can do this with the XOR instruction. Right, so bitwise XOR. Yes? Two questions. Uh, the first question is, in between the initialization of X, Y, and Z in the C codes and the part where we assign them, mm -hmm. since they're defined in terms of each other, are we assuming that in the dot, 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 things are happening where we have values? Things, things are happening here, yes. So I am assuming that someone has already stored something in, the, in, in uh, X and Y. Yes. Okay. So for the shifting here, mm -hmm. uh, You could, yes, but that, that would be uh, three instructions. So that, it's, it's nicer if we can do it with one. OK, um, any other questions? OK, so if I give you some straight line code that consists of simple, consists of simple operations, now you should be able to um, go and produce the assembly for it, right? But what about conditional statements, right? What about constructs like if? Um, this expression where we have some you know, conditional expression and only if this expression is true, we will execute the body of the if 
Um, and so for this, we can use a very simple recipe, very systematic recipe to translate uh, this code into RISC-V assembly. Essentially, uh, you know, we first compile this conditional expression, which we will return you know, either true or false, into xn, some, some register, which is some register to hold the result. And then we do this branch instruction over here, where if xn is 0, we will jump or we will branch to this end if location over here. And otherwise, we'll fall through. We will not take the branch. And then we will run through the instructions following the branch, which um, essentially have the body of, of the if, right? Um, and so one thing to emphasize here is you see this label, right? When, whenever we, we write this statement, you know, like end if, um, and then, and then a colon, basically in assembly, this is a label. And a label is, doesn't take any space. It's just an abstraction for addresses. It's simply because we want to, uh, you know, when we, when we load values or when we branch to different locations, we want to represent the location, the particular location in the code in a more symbolic way. You know, it'd be, it'd be very hard if we were to manually, um, uh, you know, specify all the offsets and all the addresses in all of the branches, right? And so assembly lets us do, you know, by, by introducing this notion of labels, um, we can uh, essentially code this in a simpler way, right? Okay, so, yes. No, it can be anything. It can be absolutely anything. So this is a straight up go to? <coughs> yes. <laughs> it's all go to's. It's, it's all go to's in, in the end. <laughs> so, um, OK. So if I give you this, uh, this C code, right, this simple if statement, if x is less than y, then uh, you know, store y minus x into y. How do we compile this? So. We can start following the recipe, and so if we say that x10 holds x and x11 holds y, then what instructions should we use? You know, we have the end if label. But how do we compile these different statements? I mean, you might be thinking of a sophisticated way to do it, but let's just first follow the recipe. So we're going to first compile this expression, right? x is less than y. We have one instruction that gives us one if x is less than y and zero otherwise. <coughs> yes, it's called set if less than, right? So we have the temporary x12 is one if x10 is less than x11, <coughs> right? And then we put the branch like this one above, right? We simply branch to end if, if x12 is zero, right? And then we compile the body of the loop, y equals y minus x. How do we do this? What instruction can we use? Subtract, yes. So we, simply, we can simply write sub x11, x11, x10, right? Okay, can we do better? Turns out that oftentimes you can actually combine the expression with the branch. So uh, RISC V has different branches, and so in this case, you basically want to branch if x is not less than y, which is, which means that if x is greater or equal than than y, right? So we have a branch if greater or equal instruction, and so with a single instruction we can do the same thing. So sometimes you can do this optimization if your uh, branch condition is simple, but not all the time. Okay. Yes. No, this is simply an indentation thing. So what what you'll see is that uh, we indent all the instructions one one level, and then the labels are not indented. That's just a matter of code style. Okay, so if else statements, very much the same, right? Instead of um, having, so we have if some expression, we run if body, otherwise, if that expression is not true, 
then we run, we run else body. And so the way we uh, can implement this is through a slight variation of the template in the previous slide, where we compile the expression just like before, we branch just like before, and if we don't branch, then we essentially run through the if body. But here you can see that we have two labels, right? So when we branch, we're going to branch to the else part of the, of the loop, and then once we go through the if body, we branch unconditionally, we jump to end if. Right, so there are two possible paths of execution through this code. Either you go through, you fall through this branch, this branch is not taken, in which case you go directly to end if and skip the else. Otherwise, you go, uh, y y this branch branches to the elf side of, uh, of the code and then um, you, you run only through the else, right? Any questions? Yes. Sorry? Like, why doesn't it run and if after it finishes else? After it finishes el else, you're going to go down through el and if anyway. Right? So you could you could write jump and if here, but why would you? You're you're already, you know, by default you're going to execute instructions in sequence, right? Uh, yes, we do, because whatever follows, you know, end if is whatever follows this code, right? So whether you go through if or else, you, you want to run whatever's below here, yeah. right? And so you want to, when you're done with, with, the, with the else part of, of the if, you want to go down, right, and, and, and keep executing instructions. All right, so. Let's talk about loops. So, so far we've seen branches that essentially go forward in the code to skip some, uh, some code. Um, but loops we compile using what we call backward branches, branches that jump back to code that we've executed previously. Um, and so the simplest uh, loop in C, and you can then express all these, all other loops in terms of this loop, is what we call the while loop. So while, um, you know, the syntax here is while this expression is true, um, evaluate or run the body and then come back and evaluate the expression again, right? And so this will loop until this expression is false, at which case we'll go to the code below. <coughs> and so the way um, we, we can compile this is essentially by first, you know, just like before, compiling the expression, uh, the conditional expression into xn, um, and then branching uh, to, the, to this n while label that follows the whole body of the loop. We compile the body of the loop and then we branch back to the while label, right? So what this code is going to do is it will run through this set of instructions a number of times and then it will eventually uh, evaluate this expression, see that it's false and jump to end while, right? Okay, can you do better? You know, this is, this is okay and this is very simple, but every loop iteration, we actually are taking two branches, right? We're taking a conditional branch here and then we're branching back. And so in steady state, let's say that this loop runs for, for a long time, we're actually spending a long time you know, we're, we're in, in steady state, we're running two branches when in fact, you can actually do it with one. Right, and so to do it with one, you can flip the condition and the, um, and the body. So if you put the, the body of the loop first and then do the comparison and conditionally jump back, or conditionally branch back, and at the beginning, first you need to evaluate the condition, so you jump to compare, go through here, and then go back to loop, and so on. Right, so this is simply a trick to save you one instruction in steady state, and of course, you know, we have one instruction, one jump there, but we only execute that jump at the beginning of the loop. Okay, any questions? Yes. <coughs> 
across across iterations. Um, so if the if the body of the loop changes xn, we don't care because we're producing a fresh value for xn here, right? So we, we could actually use uh, the value. Okay, so so far we've seen uh, how to compile simple expressions. Let's move on to, to procedures. So large programs always consist, consist of multiple procedures, multiple functions or subroutines. Essentially a procedure is a fragment of reusable code that performs a specific task. So you can see one uh, particular example with, with uh, GCD, right? This, this code implements uh, Euclid's algorithm for uh, finding the greatest common denominator between two integers. Um, and so, you know, we've seen different implementations of GCD before, but in this particular case, you know, you can, you, you already know how to do this loop, right? This if else um, statement, but you know, what about everything else, right? So basically we have multiple elements in, in this GCD function. Uh, there's a named entry point, right? This function has a name so that other parts of the code, other functions or subroutines can invoke it. Um, it has some arguments or parameters, in this case, two integers, a and b. It also has some local storage. We can define new variables, x and y, um, which in this case, we initialize to a and b, right? And this will only be visible to the code uh, within this, this procedure. And finally, when the procedure finishes execution, it returns control to the caller and might return some values. So in this case, uh, this GCD method or this, this GCD procedure is uh, producing some result that it stores in X and when it's done, it returns it to whoever invoked this method. Okay, so this is great for two things, right? We can uh, abstract the implementation details of, uh, you know, uh, particular algorithms, um, and then we can reuse them across many other procedures. Um, and so, for example, we can write this bool co-primes function that returns true if the GCD of A and B is one, right? If they have no common factors. Um, and so, you know, you can then elsewhere in the program call co-primes with different arguments and it will do the right thing. And when you call co-primes, you don't you're not concerned with whether this uses GCD or what the implementation of GCD even is, right? We're essentially abstracting uh, the details of, of the implementation. Okay, so there's two general ways to implement procedures. We can do, essentially, uh, if we have a program with multiple procedures, one simple thing would be to inline them. For every call that we find, the compiler could go and substitute the call with the body of the uh, procedure, right? And so we'd end up with one giant chunk of code that then we would, we would run, right? Okay, so this is actually what BlueSpec does, right, when talking about circuits. But this, in, in the context of programs, this has a couple of problems. Can anybody venture a guess, like what? What would be some issues of this approach? Yeah, so recursion is one big issue. Code size is another one, right? If, if you have a procedure and you're using it 100 times, then you're gonna have 100 copies of, of uh, the procedure. So recursion is, uh, is, is a more fundamental one, right? So recursive procedures are procedures that essentially invoke, uh, invoke themselves. And so factorial here is, is one simple example. So we can compute the factorial on, of some integer by multiplying by the integer and then calling factorial of n minus one. Right, and so this is, this is a very simple, very elegant implementation. However, you know, if you were to try to do inlining here, it turns out that doesn't work, not only because you'd, you'd end up inlining uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of factorial calls, but you don't even know how many times to inline because you don't, you know, how many times, how many calls uh, to factorial, you know, are, are going to take place depends on the value uh, that you call factorial with. So, to solve this problem, what compilers uh, typically do, or the default option with compilers, is what we call linking. So we're going to produce separate code 
a separate piece of code for each procedure, separate assembly for each procedure, and then we're going to establish a calling convention that essentially lets multiple methods um, call each other and interact with each other in a very standard way. So um, in, this, in this world, essentially, we're going to have a caller and a callee. So the procedure that invokes uh, a, a different procedure, we call it the caller. And the procedure being, in call, uh, being invoked, we call the callee. Um, and so the callee is basically going to evaluate all the input arguments, uh, store them somewhere where the callee can, receive, can, can read them, and then transfer control to the, to the callee. And then the callee is going to produce you know, whatever results it needs. Um, and transfer control back to the caller when it's done. Okay, any questions? So, um, there are many uh, issues and many problems that we need to solve uh, to, to do this correctly, right? So how um, can we establish a convention that let, let us, lets us reliably communicate arguments and, and return values across procedures? How can we transfer control between the caller and the colleague. Also, how should the caller and colleague share registers, right? We need some sort of convention that lets us know which registers are okay to use. And then if we need more registers than, than we actually have, how can we let each procedure use more storage than we have available in the register file, right? And what are some conventions to do that in a, in a very orchestrated way? Um, and so the um, you know, to, to make sense of all of these, essentially uh, each uh, system will, will specify its own calling convention, right? It's basically a set of rules that specify how procedures interact. Um, and one of the most basic things of a calling convention is specifying the rules for register usage, right? You're going to want to pass values, uh, pass arguments and results through some particular registers, use, or use some registers with some particular semantics. Um, and so there are multiple dimensions here, but one very important one is the difference between what we call callee saved registers and caller saved registers. So callee saved registers are preserved across function calls, right? Across procedure invocations. So if you're in, in, in a procedure, in, in a function, and you invoke some other function, you expect when that function returns that all callee registers, all callee saved registers will be as they were when, before you called the, the, the procedure, right? And so it's callee saved, it's called callee saved because if the callee wants to actually use the register, it needs to save it, 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 it needs to save its contents somewhere else, and then it needs to restore those contents before returning control to the caller. And also, you know, by symmetry, a caller safe register is not preserved across, across uh, function calls. So the callee is free to override that register and do whatever it wants with it. And that means that if the caller wants to preserve its, its contents, then it needs to save that register or the value of that register somewhere else and then load it back when it, when it needs it, right? Because there are no guarantees that this value uh, will be preserved. So the RIS-5 uh, calling convention actually not only specifies which registers are callee saved versus caller saved, but it actually gives each register, or each, uh, you know, it, it divides uh, registers X0 through X31 into groups, and it gives them different symbolic names that denote their function, their, denote their role in, this, uh, in uh, this calling convention. And so there are multiple classes here, and there's a lot of information. So here, you know, I'm going to show you an overview uh, fairly quickly, and then we'll go dissect the different parts. But basically, we have uh, registers X10 to X17 um, are, are given symbolic names A0 to A7, and they're used to pass arguments. So we'll, those are the registers that we will put arguments into when uh, we want to invoke some other procedure. And then from those registers, A0 and A1 are also used to return values. So that when, the, when the callee is done, it will store the result in those two registers. Um, we also need to figure out how to do control transference. And, and, and the important thing there is, you know, when you invoke a procedure, when a caller invokes a callee, it also needs to tell the callee where to jump back once it's done, right? And so we'll use register X1, which we rename as RA for return address, uh, to, to store the address that we want to go back to. Um, 
There's also two other classes of registers that we will use for internal storage uh, within the procedure. Um, so we have registers T0 to T6 and S0 to S11. Um, the difference between these two classes is that T, the, the T registers are caller saved and the S registers are callee saved. Right? They are preserved across function, function calls. Um, and finally, there are some registers uh, that have uh, you know, different, different usage. So the stack pointer we will see in a few slides. And then we have the global pointer thread and thread pointer, which are constant. So they're neither callee saved nor caller saved because they're not supposed to be written to. Um, and finally, the ABI or the calling convention also specifies that you, know, you can, instead of, so as you've seen, x0 is hardwired to zero. Every time that you read x0, you're gonna get the value zero. So they might as well call it zero rather than x0. Okay, so just as an example, if I give you an instruction at t0 s3 a0, what does this mean, right? Can you give me an equivalent instruction uh, with registers x0 to x31? So what is, what is register t0 in this case, looking at this table? Right, and so you can go register by register and essentially translate it back to the actual register indices, right? Okay, so to call a procedure, basically we, or the caller, first places all the arguments in, in registers A, A0 through A7, and then it transfers control to the callee. And to transfer control to the callee, we have this helpful instruction call jump and link register, right? So we have uh, jump and link uh, is, is the actual instruction, right? So this instruction uh, stores PC plus four to whatever destination register we give it, and then it jumps to uh, some label, you know, to the contents of, or, or to the location, to some location in the code. Um, so we generally want to, uh, abstract the fact that we're using RA, and so you'll, you'll often see RA being omitted. So when you see jump and link to label, this translates to the instruction jump and link RA label. Okay, then uh, the colleague runs and places the results in registers A0 and A1. Uh, maybe it doesn't produce any result, in which case it, it's not going to override these registers in any, in any way, but now, the key thing is we're gonna use the value of register RA, which remember stores PC plus four from, from the caller, right? The instruction following the, the jump and link instruction. Um, and we do this with uh, essentially this jump and link register instruction, right? So the jump and link register instruction has this semantics. Um, and so in our particular case, we don't actually need to store anything in RD because we don't care about uh, the address that we're using. So, uh, you know, the, the address that we're currently at, we care where we're jumping back. Um, and so we'll write jump and link register to x0, um, and then rs1 basically is, uh, you know, the source register that we want to jump to. Um, so this is, this is commonly abbreviated as jump register. Um, and because we don't even want to see RA here, we'll just write ret, which translates to jump register RA, which translates to jump and link register x0, 0, RA. Um, and so although this is a fairly complicated dance of pseudo instructions, the point is that, uh, you know, the important point here is that when you, ta when, when you write jump and link and ret, you need to remember that you're actually writing and reading register RA. Okay, so let's see this with, with a concrete example. Suppose that we have uh, code for the caller here, right? So this is a very simple uh, <coughs> caller that uh, you know, takes x, set, sets x to one, y to two, and then calls uh, sum of x and y of x and y, uh, and uh, once the result in variable c, so we can uh, compile this expression by essentially loading immediates one into a zero, uh, two into a one, right, which are the first and second arguments of the sum procedure, and then running jump and link to sum, 
And then with the procedure, the SAM procedure will return control to the instruction following this one, right, with the right value stored in A0. Now we already have C in A0, so we need to load A1 with the value 2 again, and then we can again jump and link to SAM, and that is it. That's how you compile this code. Now, SAM has a very simple implementation, so Basically, we take both arguments, a0 and a1, and store the result in a0, and then we simply return. So what's going on here is each invocation is returning control to the right address, so we're invoking this procedure twice. So this jump and link is storing PC plus 4, the address of this instruction, in RA, and then sum, you know, when it runs this red instruction here, is jumping back to this li instruction, right? And then when the caller keeps going and calls jump on link sum again, then sum is returning to the instruction following the second call to sum, right? So this return address allows a single procedure to return to whoever invoked it. Yes? Why is the sum being stored in A0, which is a function argument, as opposed to the return register? Both A0 and A1 are also result registers. So you can use A0 through A7 for arguments, and you return results in A0, through an A0 and A1. Right? So in this case, we expect the result to be in A0, just by the calling convention. OK, question. Uh, yes? So if a uh, <coughs> poly does not preserve a poly page register, mm -hmm. what errors do we get? If the poly does not preserve a colise safe register, then basically in general all hell breaks loose. So <laughs> follow the convention because uh, you know a difference here, you know, between this and Python is that there are no no uh, seat belts here. So <laughs> if if you um, if you start getting wrong addresses, uh, you know, or, or or wrong values, all bets are off in general. This is different from the processor, right? This is, this is a convention that, you know, different systems will in fact have different conventions. So this is the RISC-5, um, you know, the RISC-5 designers also establish this convention, but some other architectures have different conventions. So for example, if you look at, at x86, uh, Linux has a different convention from Windows, and Windows has different, three different conventions, and it's all, it's all a mess. But, um, you know, it's not tied to the processor. C compilers enforce it, but when you start compiling with different conventions, there's there's a lot of there are a lot of problems. So, I mean, if we wrote assembly that didn't follow the convention but was self consistent, would it run? If you if you wrote everything and you chose a different convention, then yes. But you will lose the capability of linking to any other code that's produced by a compiler. Okay, so one important uh, need here. So uh, you know, here the caller is loading two into A1 again. Why? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Because sum is unknown to the caller, right? Sum, for all we know, could be overriding a one, could be all overriding all uh, caller safe registers, and so we need to load a one again. Even though you know, if you look at the whole code, you'll see, well, a one is not being modified. Why are we loading it again? But again, the caller, the caller doesn't know anything about the callee. OK, so the last problem that we need to solve is that procedures often need storage beyond registers. So registers, in general, are not sufficient to, to um, uh, support arbitrary sequences of calls among uh, procedures. Um, and so these, these extra storage needs might happen because you need to save callee save registers, or you need to save caller save registers, or because you need to pass more arguments or results than fit in, in eight or two registers, uh, or that you know, because you need to store a large amount of local data that doesn't fit in registers. Um, and so in general, you know, one thing to take into account is that, you know, of course, the general solution is going to, to be, well, if it doesn't fit in registers, use memory. 
But one simple thing you might think about is, hey, wh why not for each function specify some storage right, that, that the function can use each time it runs? You know, some fixed addresses in, in, uh, in our program. Well, the problem with that is that you can call the same method multiple times, right? So for example, if you have a recursive method, um, you know, you, you can't have some fixed locations, right? Because that storage is not associated with the procedure. It needs to be associated with the specific invocation of the procedure, with the specific activation of, of uh, a procedure. Um, but the good news is that we only need to access the local storage of the currently executing procedure. And once we're done with that procedure, we can basically uh, just throw all, all those uh, procedures, procedure local storage, all those uh, variables, away, we can discard them safely. And so the right data structure to do this is a stack, right? Because we have a stack of procedure invocations, we're going to use a stack to store this extra data. Um, and so a stack is a last in first out queue, so basically you can push data into a stack, right? You can pop data, you can pop the top element from the stack, um, and then you can access the top element. So different architectures have many different conventions to access, uh, uh, you know, to, to um, access the stack. So for example, x86 will have specific instructions to push and pop data, but um, you know, we're gonna do something much, uh, much uh, more simple. And uh, essentially, we're just gonna keep the stack in a pre-specified and pre-allocated region in memory. So the only thing that we need is essentially a register to point to it. We are, we're going to call this the stack pointer, which if you go back to the table before, that's register x2. Um, and by convention, we're going to have a stack that grows uh, down. We, we call uh, this convention growing down because it goes from higher to lower addresses, right? So you know, one weird thing is because we represent memory with lower addresses at the top and higher addresses at the bottom. Of course, you, know, you can see that the stack is growing down, right? That's all very logical. So as you push, you know, you, you start using lower addresses. And so again, this can be a bit confusing because it looks like it's going up, but we say that it's going down. Um, so we have the stack pointer pointing to the last element we pushed, the last valid location um, of, of the stack. And then every time we, we push, we're going to decrease the stack pointer. And every time we pop, we're going to increase the stack pointer. And we can use the stack anytime we need it, but we're going to follow a very strict discipline, which is that whenever we use it, we're gonna leave it when we return control as we found it. So that then, uh, you know, the, the callee, or sorry, the caller um, can uh, go back to, to, to its own stack data. So let's see how this works with a simple example. Suppose that we want to use S2 and S1, which are called Lee safe registers within the implementation of this procedure. So this uh, is the same sequence of instructions that I, that I uh, uh, showed before in the first uh, slide. Um, but now we're using registers S0 and S1 through here, right? And so we need to do something with the stack to <coughs> be able to use these registers, right? We need to first save them to the stack and then restore them before we return. So we do the first, uh, you know, we, we save them essentially by first decreasing the stack pointer by eight, which essentially allocates two words or eight bytes of data on the stack. And then we save S0 and S1 in the two locations that we just allocated, right? Then at the end of the execution, we uh, restore these values, essentially we do the inverse procedure, we load them from the locations that we save them to, and then we restore the stack pointer to its old value by adding eight to it, right? Okay, so pictorially, this is how it looks like. Before the procedure invocation, you have some unused space in the stack, right? And then once, the, once F starts running, it stores, you know, it increases the stack pointer by two words or eight bytes, it saves as C run as one, and then once it returns, it has restored the stack pointer back to where it was, and now these locations, you know, right when it returns, of course, these locations still hold the old data, but they might be overwritten. Okay, any questions? So, um, safe, 
our Colisave registers are one example of, of how to use the stack, but there are other uh, pieces of data that we need to store in the stack. And in particular, one important case is the return address if you have a nested procedure. So, so far, we've seen calls to procedures that don't invoke other procedures, but suppose that you have a procedure that invokes a different procedure, like the co-primes one that um, uh, we showed at the beginning of the of uh, the discussion on procedures. So here, you know, the compilation of, of uh, this statement is, is pretty simple. We're essentially calling GCD with the two arguments, which are already in A0 and A1, um, and then we're uh, comparing with, with zero and then returning um, if, you know, whether this, this number, this, uh, whether the GCD call returns one, right? So the important part is not these three instructions, but the fact that um, this call to GCD overwrites array, and this return here needs the original value of array. So we need to save array in the stack, right? And how, how do you do this? This, <coughs> sorry? RA is the return address. Remember that every time we invoke a procedure, this return instruction, or this return pseudo instruction is actually jumping to the contents of the register RA. And so, um, we need to save RA uh, to the top of the stack and then restore it before we return, right? Okay, so that's how we can have procedures invoke other procedures while still keeping track of all the stack of return addresses, right? Where do we need to jump back once we're done? So in general, you can have an unbounded number of, of return uh, locations. Okay, so re recursive procedures are nothing special in this model. Once we've solved nested procedures, recursive procedures are just a special case of nested procedures. So if I give you this uh, Fibonacci method here, um, which essentially computes the n uh, Fibonacci number. It invokes itself twice, uh, except if n is less than two, and so you can compile uh, you know, the easy case first. So if uh, n is less than two, then you directly jump to, to return. Um, otherwise, you know, this code implements these two calls using, using some Colisave registers, and we need to in this particular case, because we're using Kali safe register S0, and because we're using, uh, because we're invoking uh, Fibonacci or Fib um, again, we need to also save register RA and restore it when we're done, <coughs> right? Okay, so this, again, is yet another instance of a very simple recipe. Whatever uh, you need to save, you know, at the beginning of the procedure, you allocate space for it in the stack, you save it, and then you restore it before you return. Now, in general, compilers use a consistent stack frame convention, which you do not need to learn, uh, but it, it's useful if you're looking at a particular stack dump, if something has gone wrong in the program, to know how uh, the different uh, pieces of data are stored. So basically, for each function invocation, uh, if we need arguments that don't fit in the stack, we will get them from the caller in the stack, and then uh, the, um, the Kali will store first the saved argument registers, then the saved return address, then any local registers, and then any other, you know, any other saved uh, S registers, and then uh, any other local variables that don't fit in registers. Um, and basically when the procedure is done, we uh, unwind the stack, you know, we re restore the stack, to, the stack pointer to where it was before we called it. Okay, so just to wrap things up, uh, to put it all together, um, you know, we've talked about the stack, and the stack occupies a region in memory, but there's basically three different uh, kinds of storage uh, in, in most programs, including C and including Python. Um, and so the stack holds data used by procedure calls. We also have typically some static data that's um, essentially active and exists during the whole execution of the program. These are things like global variables. And finally, we have data that survives across procedure calls, um, but doesn't necessarily exist for the whole lifetime of the program. 
Um, and so this is stored in what we call the heap. And so this data needs to be dynamically allocated uh, and different programming languages have very different conventions on how they allocate it. Uh, so in C and C++ and other uh, low level languages, we have what we call manual memory uh, management where every piece of dynamically allocated data uh, that is, you know, every chunk of data that needs to survive across procedure calls needs to be explicitly allocated and free by calling, uh, in this case, malloc and free, two methods that are provided to you by, you know, some low level runtime. Um, but most other languages um, essentially do automatic memory management, so you can create new objects, like, you know, writing d equals dict in Python, but the system will free them automatically, so you don't, you don't need to concern yourself with when these variables fall out of scope. And finally, the text region holds uh, the program code. So um, in RISC-V, uh, main memory is laid out this way. So te the text region uh, starts first, starting at address zero, and then the static and the heap, uh, the static region and the heap region are, cons are allocated consecutively. The heap grows down towards higher addresses, and then the stack is allocated at the end of the address space and grows up towards lower addresses. So basically, you can have both a bunch of stack and a bunch of uh, heap without then uh, conflicting until you use your whole uh, space. And then, you know, these three pointers that I mentioned before, so the stack pointer always points to the top of the stack. Uh, the global pointer points to the static region so that we know what global variable, how to access global variables. And then the program counter will be somewhere in the text region. All right, that's all for today. Next lecture, we'll start uh, actually seeing how to implement a RISC-V processor that executes your RISC-V programs. Good luck on the quiz.